Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to Psychedelic Society. Thank you all for coming. Very exciting to talk. Um, as you all know, Julian is uh, most well known for uh, developing Changa, this uh, blend between uh, ayahuasca herb and DMT itself. Um, personally, it's uh, my only uh, contact with that family of drugs is Changa, so uh, this is very interesting for me as well. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have the talk first for about uh, an hour-ish, and then after that we're going to have a Q&A session for about uh, half an hour, so you can uh, just leave your questions for them and we can have a brief discussion. Um, and Julian has also brought uh, his book with him, Articulations, uh, and he will do a signing afterwards, um, and it's on sale for 20 euros. Uh, so we'll get started. Julian Palmer. Woo! Thanks. Well, yeah, it's really good to be here. Uh, last time I gave a talk in the Netherlands was at the Sci-Fi Festival in uh, 2006. And uh, yeah, I enjoy this country. It's probably the most reasonable country in Europe, if you ask me. Um, don't have so much time for Western Europe in particular. Um, and today I'm going to talk about Changa. And uh, uh, a lot of people ask me about its origin. They ask me, uh, you know, the early days. Um, and so I'm going to go into some of that. And I'm going to go into all the little bits and pieces related to Changa that people may not be aware of, that hasn't appeared in any book or in any of my talks. And uh, yeah, my commentary on, on Changa and other psychoactive herbs and plants and just how they work and um, what is the best way to utilize them. How can we have the most appropriate mindset uh, to work with them? So a lot of the time uh, when I'm giving a talk, I talk about mindset. Uh, which is the set in set and setting and I very much feel that when you have your mindset uh, calibrated you can really make the most and take advantage of what these compounds can do for you but to have the mindset in the first place you've got to understand or have some awareness as to how these uh, how these compounds how these plants are working with us on what they do. So I've been working with the tryptamines fairly intensely, about a couple of decades now. And for me, there's no major mystery area related to how they work and what they do. Um, and uh, when people tell me about their experiences, I'll generally say something like, yeah, I've heard that before a few times. Oh, that's pretty normal. Um, so for me, it's sort of like, this is my day job. Um, it, it's all very familiar and it's, it, uh, it hasn't ceased to lose its uh, majesty and power, but I don't have any fear about it. Don't have any fear. Um, I'm at home with it, it makes sense to me, and I see the benefits of how the tryptamines can work with people. And um, uh, related to, to Changa, I feel Changa is beneficial, that, it, that, it, that even though it can be used in a, in a recreational manner, in a purely recreational manner, and there's nothing wrong with that, there are many different levels um, in how it works and indeed and many different levels into how psychoactive plants work. So I'm going to go into my theories and understandings as to all that stuff because I pretty much feel that, you know, the science of our times uh, is not really going to be able to tell us much about what we're experiencing on the inside. In my mind, the psychedelic research involves taking the psychedelics 
and going in there and they're using your own um, technology, using your own equipment, ascertaining um, ascertaining the states and how those states uh, work for you, how to navigate those states, also so you can help other people to to navigate those states and to understand those states. So that's what I do. I've been doing it um, a fair while now. So um, Changa came about in the early noughties, around 2003, 2004. Uh, initially, I guess one of the first prototypes was um, some resin extracted from Acacia of Tusifolia, which is probably at that time in Australia, uh, from the early mid 90s, late 90s, Acacia of Tusifolia was the primary source of DMT in Australia. Probably if you had gotten DMT in Amsterdam in the late 90s, it would have been the gooey resinous stuff from Acacia of Tusifolia. Not acacia made any eye. I don't know anyone who's extracted uh, any amount of DMT from acacia made any eye. That's that's maybe just tiny little bits. Um, and acacia tusifolia uh, grows in the rainforest. It grows at height, uh, at mostly at altitude. It's a very majestic, beautiful-looking tree. You look at it and you think, "Wow, that's some kind of." crazy technology. It doesn't look like ordinary trees. And it's a very powerful tree and it has um, a lot of different alkaloids in it. It has been tested to contain 5% 5-meo DMT and maybe there's um, a whole bunch of other alkaloids, up to a dozen different alkaloids in the tree uh, I even uh, tested a strain and it happened to be the same strain that I uh, made this goo from the phyllodes, which are the leaves, and uh, that was a few years later. I I, I made some changa from this goo from the phyllodes, and people were catalyzed into something like a six-hour mushroom journey, but it, just from a few smokes, just to have a normal changa journey, then they'd be catalyzed into two, three grams of mushrooms with some sort of acacia experiences. So I only counted the alkaloid once, you know. So they give you an idea of how crazy this tree is and how little is understood about it. I don't know what that alkaloid is, but I know they're standard trees. So um, from that standard trees, I did uh, extract some goo from the phyllodes, mm -hmm. and I had heard that uh, marlene and peppermint were good to smoke DMT with. So I made these joints and I kind of got the goo in the in the in the paper and I sort of you know spread the goo around the paper and sort of you know sprinkled the marlene and peppermint in there and you know made these joints and went to a little gathering and uh, gave them out to people. They didn't smoke very well at all. People would try and smoke them and a little bit of goo would light up and then they'd try and light it again and, and then it was at night and like everyone knows how, you guys probably know how DMT just stinks out a whole area. The whole, I probably gave about 20 joints out of this gathering of like 500 people. There's just DMT <laughs> smoke everywhere <laughs> and it's not that many people smoking it. So it was really funny um, to see that. And that sort of worked. It sort of worked. So that was like a sort of early prototype. That was in 2003, in winter 2003. Um, around December 2003, uh, again, got some goo. And, okay, what do I do with the goo? I know, we'll put it in some, infuse it into ayahuasca vine. That completely makes sense. So, um, I think we had like 100 grams of goo, and then got 100 grams of ayahuasca vine, Dissolve it in some ethanol, combine it with the shredded ayahuasca vine. And then I said to a friend, look, I don't think I could do anything with this. Um, maybe just give it out to everyone. It's like a Christmas present around the Byron Bay area in Australia. So he just gave it away, gave away like 200 grams, which is quite a lot. And um, 
all the reports I got back from it were like, even the most hardcore DMT smokers said, ah, this is too intense. It's just, <laughs> no, it's just too strong. So I thought, okay, right. You know, filed that in my filing cabinet. Um, fast forward to, I think it was like April or May uh, 2004. Again, goo, heaps of goo. I think we got like 200 grams of goo. And um, in this case, I thought, okay, if it's too strong, I've got to make it weaker, not 50% DMT, but 25% DMT. So I thought, okay, fuse it in the ayahuasca vine, but add the add, uh, malene and mint, and I'll add some passion flower as well, and some blue lotus as well, because it looks pretty and I like it. And that's the original recipe. And so we had like 25%, uh, 800 grams of this stuff. <laughs> and uh, it just, uh, again, just gave it to people to give away to people. And people went, wow, right, this, is, this is amazing. And a lot of people, the feedback I got was like, oh, it's not like smoking crystal DMT, which at that time in Australia, a lot of people were around the Byron Shire. Not that many people were smoking DMT, but it was about just not that much. It was little bits and pieces. And uh, the, the feedback I got from people who smoked DMT, and normally they just smoked DMT once, and they had this very intense, overwhelming breakthrough experience, and they go, gone, holy shit, how do I integrate that? And, um, you know, it, it, it wasn't something that was really that prevalent uh, at that time. And it's not like you would go to a festival or a psychotrans party and there'd be heaps of people smoking DMT. It was very much inner circle, it was like cooler than now people. Uh, probably it was similar sort of vibe here in the late 90s, early 90s as well. And, uh, but yeah, uh, this 800 grams got out there and uh, people, the feedback I got was that uh, DMT doesn't have to be super full on. It can be gentle as well. It can be something you can integrate. You can make friends with it. And so that was the, that was the original idea behind Changa, that the idea was like, it's not the idea is to like blast your head off. The idea wasn't to make the strongest DMT possible so you could like, you know, trip the most balls you possibly can and go the deepest into hyperspace you could. The idea was that in that time, people were a little bit traumatized by DMT probably. And um, uh, I definitely noticed that people gained a lot of value from it. And I would do things like, you know, go to a uh, like a little book party in the forest and gather people together around the fire at 5 a.m. in the morning and then smoke a Changa joint with people. And uh, people loved it. It's very, uh, there's something very calming about it, uh, something centering and healing beneficial rather than the, you know, um, wham, bam, you know, going to high space and, come back and what the hell was that all that about? Oh fuck, I don't remember it now, it's slipping. Um, it was a more integratable experience. And since that time I have found, like working with people, that if you do work with the Changa um, rather than Crystal, it is more integratable, especially at the higher doses. The ayahuasca seems to allow some level of integration with the physical awareness with um, people's uh, psyche, with their mind, with their, their human reality. So the first thing we noticed, uh, apart from that it was more gentle, was that it lasted longer and quite significantly long. Now the interesting thing is technically, you know, if you look at it objectively, you'd think, well, in a gram of Changa that I was making at that time, there would only be a third of it would be my ayahuasca vine or leaf. 
And the reason I was using Leaf is because I was getting, uh, I generally want to drink the ayahuasca vine. At that time in Australia, ayahuasca vines were young. They were like four or five years old. You might get a 10 year, 10, 10 year old vine. They came in in the, in the early mid nineties. So most of the ayahuasca vines at that time, were, you know, you could be even two years old or three years old. And so there was a shortage of vines. So I would generally drink the ayahuasca vine and also just in the preparation of it, the preparation of the leaf was a lot easier. You just dry it and then you just sort of, um, you know, grind it with your hands. You don't even need to put in a coffee grinder and it's quite laborious to prepare ayahuasca vine for making chain to get the right consistency. And the ayahuasca leaf worked really well. It was very smooth, but it didn't have the afterglow of the ayahuasca vine. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if you guys might have come across um, this website, uh, Chain of the Evolution of Ayahuasca. And, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've been in communication with, the, with that guy since 2005. So, um, yeah, he had some some stories or version of events that are probably not quite accurate, <laughs> definitely not accurate. And definitely, I don't know where the agenda comes from that he wants to think that it that Chang's uh, evolution of ayahuasca. Uh, most people agree it's evolution in smoking DMT. And ayahuasca is simply a uh, facilitator of, of the DMT, just like uh, ayahuasca is a facilitator of DMT and ayahuasca brew. Um, anyway, what we were using ayahuasca leaf and um, it worked well. It was a little bit more clear, a little bit more follow through. Didn't have the afterglow, didn't quite have the warmth. So I would often combine the two, the vine and the leaf from the same vine, which worked fantastic. I found that to be um, the perfect uh, combination. And um, when, when I did the tests, uh, you know, for example, smoke some crystal DMT, smoke the equivalent of Manichanga. Oh, you know, it definitely lasts longer. And I never did the the official Jonathan Ott, you know, write it down, test it. And pretty much, I mean, uh, everyone straight away did the same tests. They, they smoked it and they're like, oh, it lasts a lot longer. And it, it could last even 40 minutes. Although DMT can last. I think the most I heard, the longest I heard DMT lasting by itself was 30 minutes. And I think perhaps that may be to do with some people's uh, chemistry uh, and metabolism that, that they would have that experience. But yeah, generally the, the extended duration was very obvious and uh, was only years down the track when you encountered people from overseas or online, very skeptical. And no one in Australia ever had any. Um, um, no one in Australia ever had any. Uh, what would you say? Um, questions about that because we all just simply ascertained that it, it lasted much longer. And um, so that was that was a, a, a definite benefit. The other benefit was you didn't have to smoke DMT in a crack pipe. So I was smoking DMT in a crack pipe at the time. Probably, I would say the best way to smoke DMT is um, in a bong or, or in a sort of a, um, a water pipe of some sort. Uh, with the DMT um, in, um, sandwiched in between two herbs, it's called the sandwich method. And I'd say you can smoke a lot of DMT and I would do that in one pull. Um, you could smoke 100 milligrams, 200 milligrams, which is, you don't want to smoke 200 milligrams, you just black out. You, you know you've done too much when you just black out, you don't remember anything, then you work your way back down. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it just, it, you, you, it just gets exceedingly intense and then you black out and, and then and then your friends tell you that you're speaking alien languages and uh, all kinds of crazy things. So 
uh, yeah, the advantage is the, the, the ease of smoking it. And you also, you could uh, roll it in the joint, um, which is, um, it's just so, you know, people would, you know, people look at DMT crystal and they'd be quite intimidated by it. And, and with Changa, they, 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 you know, immediately just think, oh, just, you know, put that in your pipe and smoke it. You know, people would have this sense of, um, that, that it was more accessible, that it was more, um, it was more available. And it did become fairly available in Australia. Um, some of you might have read Graves and John's book. Um, um, is it uh, Memoirs from Eternity? Uh, Cultural History of DFT. And he talks about the Australian uh, shop called Happy Herbal Highs, who was selling uh, a product they called Dream Time. Uh, uh, in in their shop, and uh, I think it would have been from maybe two thousand five to about two thousand eight. They sold that, and they sold heaps of it behind the counter, and it got a bit of a reputation even overseas. It was it was uh, it was quite a big deal. Um, people knew about it and they're sharing it with their friends and yeah I really got out there into the into the general community. Um, but in the early days um, didn't have a name for it. Just called it smoke mix or smoking mix. And uh, basically um, I think that was I don't remember the exact timeline, but it was quite some time before I realized this stuff has to have a name because uh, uh, other people were making it too. But the funny thing was they didn't ask me, oh, how do you do this? I think about maybe half a dozen people. They all kind of, you know, got some from me and they all scurried off and just figured out how to do it themselves. None of them asked me, so what ratios do you use? What plants do you use? Um, so this this whole story for me has been quite an insight into the nature of the human ego and the sort of like politics of power and the, the, the morphogenetic of language, which we're going to go into. Um, so yeah, I realized um, it had to have a name. And so I did an ayahuasca group in my house and um, okay, I'm gonna call in a name and the name came through Changa. And I was like, oh, I don't like that name. That sounds very Aussie. Uh, it's very Aussie. It sounds like, um, like Bogan. I don't know if you guys know Bogan. It's, it's like the, the close to the bottom of the social hierarchy is the Bogan, you know, with the tracksuit pants and the, and the, uh, the moccasins and uh, the bad daytime TV. Um, <laughs> so it sounds like, uh, you know, yeah, pass it, Changa, mate. Fucking, let's smoke up some of that Changa you got, eh, bro? <laughs> <laughs> so there was great resistance to this name in Australia. The, the average man on the street did not, did not, didn't pick up, didn't pick up. In the early days, it did pick up at all, really. Um, apart from it, it picked up mostly from people who would buy it at, at the Happy Herbal Hire shop. Um, but in, in terms of psychedelic users and DMT smokers, they just kept smoking DMT, you know. Um, it, it didn't. It didn't really get much uptake in Australia uh, in the early days. Um, it only really got uptook in Australia in the late noughties when suddenly, oh, people overseas has recognised this is actually a thing. Oh wow, must be really a good thing then. Now we'll do it, you know. And then, then the name changed. It was no longer Changa. It was like Chonga. <laughs> All these variations, or like uh, 
you know, mm-hmm. like my grandmother would call like Australian town uh, Wong, Wongaratta when it's normally, uh, most people call it Wangaratta. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it sort of made a few people cringe and sort of over the years, over the years, like I said, there's some sort of morphic feel related to a name. Initially it made me cringe for some years. <laughs> and I thought, what have I done? Maybe that was the wrong name. You know, what, did I, what did I do to the world, you know? <laughs> now I think it's kind of cool. Um, it means all kinds of things in different languages. There's like a, a Russian cartoon called uh, you know, Changa Changa, um, uh, which is in a, in a, in a famous animated um, uh, TV show called Katarok. And uh, it means all kinds of things in Sanskrit, and I can't remember um, all, all that stuff. But um, yeah, over the years, I watched I watched the name change, and you know, I'm slightly amused how people different people pronounce it. And I sort of feel like you know, you say tomato, I say tomato. Um, don't control these things, um, and. Uh, yeah, like these days, you know, officially I'm sort of given the title, like, yeah, I you do it in name channel. You know, I sort of feel like, well, I didn't just name it, guys. It was a little bit more involved than that. Uh, and you have all these people online saying, yeah, you know, I met a guy in, uh, 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 you know, Burning Man in 84 who gave me some Changa, you know. Um, <laughs> I say, well, I very much doubt that's the case. Are you, are you saying that guy's lying? You know, uh, yeah, I think so. Um, so yeah, it wasn't just the naming um, at that time in Australia. No one was smoking DMT with ayahuasca, as far as I know. Maybe they were, but they didn't tell me about it. And when I presented it to them, or no one said, "Yeah, look, me, me mates, we 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 smoke uh, beta carbolins and uh, DMT all the time." No one said that. It was a completely new thing. It was not known at the time. So now you've got all these people come out of the woodwork and say, yeah, 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 I used to do that. Yeah, oh, no, me and my mates, we, we developed that before you did. And some old lady in Tasmania who says, yeah, you know, she, she invented Changa. But, you know, again, you come back to definitions. Um, basically, my definition and how I defined it is that it is the ayahuasca, Vine, not Syrian rue or something, um, combined with a blend of herbs which act in a synergistic manner so that when you smoke the DMT, the, the ayahuasca and the DMT actually um, synergize and you experience an amplified effect from the herbs. And we figured this out because when you smoke it, you can feel the influence of the herbs. Um, most significantly, I experienced mullein giving me incredible lung healings that I would just be on anything I've experienced because I was a bit of a chain smoker at that time. And, um, yeah, so... At this point, yeah, what, what do you say? I mean, yeah, okay, well, maybe maybe you did. Maybe there were people smoking beta carbolines and blends of herbs that they didn't call a changa and they didn't spread it around the world. So there's something I find a little bit offensive that people say, you didn't invent changa because it's sort of like saying, well, you're a liar, you know. But I put my dick on the line. Should we save questions for later? What's that? Should we save questions for later? Yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, brought it to many countries. Um, yeah, I was the one who brought it to Europe in 2005 and brought it to the guy who brought it to the Boom Festival first in 2006. 
I was the one who showed the guy who brought it to Brazil first in 2006. And I think probably um, why it why it actually took off is because this guy who went to Brazil, I think, um, actually was fairly well known and connected in the English Citran scene and uh, quite well known and famous. Um, and when he went to Brazil, uh, he showed a few different people how to make it and then it just spread through Brazil. So Brazilians, they have no idea where it comes from. They somehow think it sprang up in the Amazon. But um, no, it came from this English uh, English guy. And I went to Brazil a few years ago and I, I told them this and they were quite amused by it. And um, yeah, I think, uh, but largely I would say the early popularization came through these two people one in Spain and one in the UK, and they really did that early missionary work and got it to the right people, and uh, uh, that that's how it popularised among the, the two cool for school crowd. And um, at that time, there wasn't many people making DMT in Europe. I mean, this guy who was selling uh, DMT at the, at the Boom Festival he says it's pretty much the only one who was selling it. There weren't other people selling it. Um, when, uh, when uh, you know, half a kilogram of uh, Chang'e magically arrived at the Boom Festival in 2008, uh, <laughs> it, it really uh, did, uh, did uh, people, people got it. People really got it. People really got it. Um, saw what it was, but people have been doing it for quite some years before that. And uh, but in the early days, it was it took some time for people to get it. I think um, there's that sort of morphic resonance. I think that 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 morphic resonance effect in the very early days. I know a woman who showed some of the uh, very old school psychedelic mafia, who were pretty much in charge of the DMT supply. In, in, uh, the world at that time, so they claimed, and uh, she said they didn't get it. She said they didn't get it at all. She said they were just like, so what? You know. Um, so that was a fairly sort of typical reaction from people. It sort of it took some time before it took hold. That people saw its value and they made friends with it, and that. Um, they they uh, realised that this that that why would you want to bother with DMT crystal? So why would you want to smoke Changa anyway? Why would you want to smoke DMT? And I think that's, I think that initially, before anyone smokes DMT, they will pretty much have no idea what they're about to experience. That's always this sort of curious element that, that, that uh, and because it is like a red pill experience, um, once you've taken the red pill, it's a bit too late. I remember watching The Matrix in 1999, and it was just after I did a percussion course, and I was talking with a couple of guys there who smoked DMT, which is fairly not that many people. I didn't meet too many people who smoked DMT at that time. And they said, yeah, that, that scene where Keanu takes the red pill and has that, that experience, that's classic. But it's classic um, uh, DMT. And I definitely think that when you do take a sufficient amount of DMT, it does work like a red pill because it does show you um, a greater context of 
um, existence. And especially when you smoke the, the, the breakthrough DMT, I think there is a communication there that transcends language, but it's very, very direct. And it really puts you, it gives you an awareness or a context for your individual existence. It can often be for some people like a near-death experience. Um, and it's pretty much impossible to describe the, the breakthrough experience, as I'm sure many of you know. Um, but after it does happen, I think most people will realize that they'll have the awareness and the recognition that there is something greater than themselves, uh, that they have an experience or have an awareness of a reality and a consciousness that is much more expansive than themselves and have a appreciation for the context of their life. And I think a lot of people can have this experience or this awareness that we're living in uh, a simulation. And I think this is a kind of a, an article that might appear in Wired like it's a new idea. It's not a new idea. This idea has uh, was, was, was first came through the... The, the, the Indians um, the, the, who, who wrote the Vedas who have the, uh, had the idea that this reality was Leela, it was divine play, it was an illusion, it was Maya, it was a divine creation, it wasn't the real reality, it was a, um, a simulation of the real reality. So it's a little bit disingenuous, I think, when these articles appear in Wired or whatever, as if this is a new idea. But I do believe that ideas such as this have gained some footing in popular culture because DMT gives people a direct experience or awareness um, of, of uh, that, of, of, of that we are not necessarily the, the, the end all or be all of existence. That we are, um, you know, something, we, we are an extension of, of, of a greater existence, of a, of a greater realm of being. And if you don't accept that, I don't know what to say to you because uh, um, it's, it's, I think it's fairly obvious and evident, uh, at least for me. Um, and this is the thing about DMT and Chang'e, that the visionary space and the depths that you can go to is much stronger and intense than when you drink ayahuasca. Um, it's, it's possibly because the lungs absorb the DMT, bring it straight into the bloodstream. It could be to do with the way that the body may well produce DMT in the lungs. Um, and so it's able to assimilate it right away. Um, if, you, if you are taking it through your stomach, seems to have to go through some processes in order to reach your nervous system. So uh, when you do smoke DMT, the visions you're going to have are much brighter and clearer than when you drink uh, ayahuasca brew or you take DMT orally with, uh, with um, Syrian brew, for example. There's no question of that. And you're going to go a whole lot deeper you're going to have uh, a visionary experience that um, will exceed, exceed the, the oral DMT experience. It has many more dimensions and more depth. And the ayahuasca purists, they don't want to recognize that. However, I'm a little bit of an ayahuasca purist myself because I don't necessarily think that the that smoking DMT really gives you the amount of time you need to work in the space. 
even though I do know people who swear by taking Syrian root and smoking changa. And I've e I even been in contact with one guy in the Amazon who, rather than working with ayahuasca, that's all he works with. He gives people the Syrian root and um, gives them changa. And that's fantastic, but it's not my story. My story is working with uh, generally the acacias and Syrian rue and ayahuasca and working with them in a non-traditional manner, which means completely um, ignoring the South American traditions. Because when, when I first started getting into this, um, first started taking ML inhibitors, and acacia. I was working with Syrian root, probably wild crafted in Iran, and crystal DMT from Australia. Nothing to do with South America or any of the traditions. And I first started working with the um, taking the tea and the Syrian root. It's nothing to do with South America. And the groups that I started doing, how I developed the work that I do with people, it's not based on that, any of that traditional stuff. And I think the advantage of Chang'e as well is that um, there's no there's no background um, there's no background uh, traditional culture. Um, my approach to you know being the parent of this thing was really just letting it do its thing and um, not 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 coming into the public sphere until about 2010. That's when I, you know, uh, became uh, public about this. And probably that was a good thing because I felt I could uh, set a lot of people straight. Um, and there, I think that there was, uh, there was a little bit of a misguided, some misguided communications going on around that time. Even still, you've got this, you know, Zanger thing, you know, the, the X A N G A. And the reason that came about is because I met a guy, uh, I was giving out Chang'e at the first Amazonian shamanism, shamanism conference in Iquitos in 2005. And I gave it to this uh, pretty sort of, uh, you know, hipsterish West Coast dude who uh, went back to his tribe and showed, gave it to his friends and they went, wow, this stuff is awesome. It's not like I actually wrote down how how to spell it. So he decided to spell it with an X. So he they started a little kind of like tribe of people who spelled it with an X, X-A-N-G-A. -A. So it's like, it's funny how these sort of memes sort of take off, you know, unless you sort of try and, and if it's something a little bit underground like this, you can't necessarily control how, how it goes. Um, but yeah, I found, I found that quite amusing how I, um, I, I, I uh, started communicating with that guy online who I met all those years ago. And um, he, he, he thought that, yeah, he met this, this man, this woman who were in this trip to me cult from Australia. That's the memory he had of us. That was not, not quite the case. So, yeah, related to the the, the, the Chang experience, it it is more vivid. It is more you can actually um, experience the the real meat and meaning of the tryptamine consciousness when you smoke Changa than when you take DMT orally with ayahuasca. Though you certainly can go a long way with that too. You really can, for sure you can. But there, there is certainly something special about it when you smoke it. But I would say that, for example, when I first first started smoking DMT, DMT told me, or the acacia told me, don't worry about this, live your life, do your thing. You don't need to know about any of this. Just be human. So I've always I tried to be human. I've tried to live my life to the maximum capacity that I can. I think you, you won't meet new, too many people who live their life to the capacity that I do. Um, and 
rather than, I think, being distracted by hyperdimensional reality, for example, I think that, you know, in the, for example, the Buddhist meditators, when they have visions, they they see those visions as lesser lights. They see them as distractions on the path, as like the Buddha on the road that you've got to run over and kill. But they're not the ultimate realization. And I'm not saying I believe in the ultimate realization, but I think that you can get people can get distracted and overcome and overwhelmed and a bit worked up and um, confused by all these different realities that you can experience and all the different beings and all the things that you can experience can become, take you down all kinds of crazy rabbit hole. And um, I think that we've got, to, we've got to really question that, see what value there is in this experience. Um, I would say, you know, I don't really know people who... I used to know in the early noughties or even 10 years ago who pick up a pipe of DMT and smoke Changa every week or DMT every week. Don't necessarily think it's a sustainable path. Uh, I believe that if you're really going to do deep work, you, well, you know, like the guy taking the theory and ruin the Changa, you can do it that way. But, you know, I'm more a proponent of that four to six hour you know, of that workspace. And, you know, when that, 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 that space is all you need, like it's hyper vivid enough, it's, it's, it's intense enough, you don't need more. So I sort of feel that, I sort of see Changa and smoke DMT as nitroglycerin into human consciousness. So kind of like, you know, shake up the brittle, condition mind and sort of blast open the pineal gland and the third eye and just rattle people up and wake them up uh, into an awareness that, that there's more to life than the, 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 the meat space, that the, the, the scientific materialism is uh, irrelevant in the face of infinity. And, um, you know, if you don't get that, then, you know, keep smoking you know, go 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 visit the uh, go visit my friend the lumberjack after the talk, and he'll set you up. <laughs> <laughs> he likes dad with dogs, apparently. So I think that um, yeah, it it can be a a space in which you people can become distracted by all the beings and all the beauty and it can become not quite addictive and i think what can happen to people is that they can be a bit like they can get quite um compelled by it what generally tends to happen is that the experience becomes a bit darker for people it starts to become a bit darker and uh it starts the, the rabbit hole expands and people I don't know anyone who'll say that, oh, no, and like, you know, all those rabbit holes, I go down all of them and it got deeper and bigger and, you know, I didn't freak out. I think everyone's got the point at which they're going to crack and they're going to you go, okay, that's enough. That, you know, that's too much already. So generally, I think perhaps the early days or the times in which you smoke and DMT can be quite seductive. I think there comes a point for... Uh, most people whereby um, it, it sh you know you kind of get shown um, the, the depth and uh, the depth and extent of of what's really there and um, it, it can be quite demanding so demanding so I think there can generally be something like a two-year honeymoon that people have with, with smoking means and then yeah like you know i'm more a proponent of non-traditional um taking dmt orally because that's a more that's a workspace that i find that that, that works best for me 
But, you know, saying that, it's sort of, um, I don't necessarily judge people's, the, you know, so-called recreational utilization of Changa. I don't think any psychedelics purely recreational. You know, again, it comes back to your mindset as well. Um, they, there's certain there's certain demanding elements within within psychedelics, and um, I think that um, it's necessary to if you're really going to go somewhere with it, if you're really going to take it somewhere, then you've got to take it seriously. And I think it asks you to take it seriously. You know, uh, I think that for a lot of people, it would kind of it's got a sort of uh, inbuilt mechanism. For some people, it will just stop working. For example, it will just stop working, and it will or it will just say, "Stop doing this." You know that happens quite commonly as well. So it has inbuilt mechanisms. I mean, it. I probably mean the plant, the plants, the particular plants from which the DMT comes will communicate and say to people. Or we'll stop giving people the experiences that they're looking for. You know? they've, they've sort of like uh, got they've got the message, you know, a little bit like what well, you got the message hang up the phone. In terms of psychedelics, I mean, I think that um, because for me they're medicine. For me, they're always beneficial. It's not like there's always a message there. For me, it's a workspace. For me, it's a a space of being conscious and aware. It's not necessarily just receiving, you know, cosmic messages or having this illumination. That's a factor there too, you know. But I don't believe in just stopping them altogether and just, you know, continuing your yoga practice or whatever. Uh, I believe they're essential medicines and uh, necessary for our evolution at this point. So... Um, I think in the West we have this idea of hallucinations, of there being um, a state in which you're, uh, it's almost like this narcissistic state, that what you're experiencing is just coming from your own brain. And this is evidently false. This is evidently bullshit that this is actually the case. It is very clearly that... The, the experience that you're having uh, arising from an interrelationship of many different factors, many of which are invisible and can't be seen, which would logically make sense considering we see it ridiculously. Uh, we have access to a very a small um, band of information that we can innately tune into. And I think when we smoke the tryptamines, we start to be able to, like, have a, an awareness that might have baseline awarenesses like that, suddenly we have this greater awareness and we can see so much more. We can have an awareness of many more things. And my, my understanding is that reality is vast and unlimited and unfathomable and hugely mysterious. And where does it end and where does it begin and how does it work? It's just impossible to understand. And for me, um, even, even with the vivid visions that I have and the incredible beings that I would meet and their communications, I think it does take a while for the quote-unquote rational mind to just give it up and just go, okay, well, that's what it is and that's what I'm experiencing now without necessarily having any recourse to any explanation, but this is reality for me at this point. This is what I'm experiencing and it appears to be what it appears to be. <laughs> Not what my rational, quote unquote, rational mind says it is. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, well, the, the quote unquote rational mind, the unrational mind, I should say, it wants to maintain control. It often wants, doesn't want to like give up the idea that it doesn't understand reality because that's very threatening in survival terms. I call it the mammoth theory, the idea that if you 
if you if you don't have a grip on the present circumstance, if you don't understand um, how things work, if you have to surrender control of your uh, your your awareness or your understanding, that that like that hits us in the gut in survival sense, and we think we're going to die. You know, there's something very fundamental in the human organism that wants to maintain. Um, the understanding that we have an awareness of how this works and how 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 it functions. When we don't, we don't know what we don't know. There is so much we don't know. And I think the tryptamine show us that we don't know shit. And you know, people who have extensive experience like Dennis McKenna, fully aware of that. Fully aware. That is very, very good. If you don't get that, I don't know what to say to you. I recently uh, did an interview in Australia and I uh, filmed, uh, interviewed 50 people and one of the, the topics I wanted to talk about was uh, what were people's views or ideas of um, so-called supernatural phenomena or the beings that you can experience in the tryptamine space. And I was surprised. There was like a few people sitting on the fans. Uh, it was pretty much one guy who said that that you know he didn't didn't believe in the beings. Everyone else is just like uh, come to terms with it. Um, so that's the sort of milieu we have in Australia. I was expecting at least you know I tried to find some people who. You know, would stand up and say, "No, I don't believe in the beings." In in the psychedelic world in general, um, um, it's just like Benny Shaman, there's James Kent, and um, there's a guy who lives in Rotterdam. His name? No, he lives in Den Haag. His name? Daniel Waterman. Daniel Waterman. Also him. That's it. In the people who write stuff and and communicate in the psychedelic scene, they're the only people. Everyone else is just like either sitting on the fans or, you know, communicating some sort of compromised position but then having their own personal uh, position. Or I'd say in general, most people just come to terms with these realities but it's so evident. And I think you'd have to be a bit stupid not to get it. You'd have to, you'd, you really have to be someone who's just possessed by your own mind. Your mind parasites just take control. You know, you, you, you're so possessed by your mind power that you become stupid. This is this is this is perhaps the, the norm of the skeptic the skeptical mindset, something like that. I guess I guess that kind of stupidity is fairly common in society. But you know, go visit my friend the old dog loving lumberjack. I mean, yeah, I suppose, yeah, come to me, you know. I'll change your mind. <laughs> it's not that hard. You just gotta smoke it correctly. There really is um, a space of inquiry when we take psychedelics, and that that's significant. There is this awareness of the self and the relationships that we have. There is a great awareness mind, the emotion, uh, all the complexity, you can see it from many different perspectives and that workspace is valuable enough. Um, you don't need to have the experience of the, 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 the hyperdimensional consciousness. Some people will just not see visions, you know, some people will, will you know, no matter how much you give them, though they're fairly rare, but some people will not have visions but that space that self-awareness that the greater awareness you can have of yourself and this reality that is significant that is a space in which you can work on yourself where you can look at yourself and you can go under the hood and you can change you can change some stuff that's significant that's the power of psychedelics. That's how we got a psychedelic renaissance because that kind of change, you don't, you don't get to talking for your therapist, you know, an hour a week, you know. It's that commonly said thing that, that psychedelics, 10 years of psychotherapy 
in um, a few hours. Psychotherapists have said this too, it's drunk with it's, it's, it's that common thing because they can work when you can go, oh, all right, that's why I do that. Oh, I don't have to do that anymore, just let it go. And, and there is that, that, that ability for, for the human being to really come into greater alignment with themselves. And there really is something in us that is aligned and tuned by these plants. And the mechanisms by which that happens, um, I think, are not well understood. We not really even understand what we are, you know. As far as I understand, uh, what we are is, is very mysterious. But I can say that what what a human being is <clears throat> is brought back into balance and alignment. It's a little bit like uh, uh, being plugged back into the the computer like you're some sort of sports car which is, you know, recalibrated back into factory settings. And, you know, plants like a boga will do that. They'll literally reset the brain. They will reset those settings. And the, the boga will, will pretty much, for most people, people will experience the boga spirit communicating. <clears throat> you know, it has been something that many uh, neuroscientists have been trying to understand how a boga works. Um, my understanding of boga works because Dr. Aboga is communicating with the individual about their childhood and why they're so fucked up as an adult and how they can actually address that and fix that. Um, and that's just, that's just how it works. Um, it's, it's very simple. But I think that, that you can, say when you smoke Changi, you can really feel, it's almost within seconds, you can feel this, you can feel this level of intensity whereby you, you are brought back into a greater alignment with uh, yourself. You're brought into a more sincere contact with who you are and your reality. I think that is something that is, 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 is a strong part of it. And I think the reason why it feels good and is pleasurable and probably should feel good is your body is telling you, like, whatever you just did, do that shit again. <laughs> <laughs> that was really good. It did some good things. And that, that's, that's a, you know, as part of a Western society, which is opposed to intoxication or pleasure. And I think that, uh, well, I, I see pleasure as your body telling you, whatever you just did, <laughs> do that again. That, that really worked well for us, you know. And I think, you know, probably too much of a good thing is not a good idea. But basically, I think if you're able to listen to those mechanisms, you can... You can go beyond the pleasure and you can understand what is happening that is, is creating those good feelings, what is creating that, that, that really healthy, positive mindset because there's some internal adjustment going on. How will that is happening, the interrelationship of brain, the nervous system and um, the, the, the molecules and all that, it's, 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 still, it's still very unknown. We don't really know how it works. So related to the visions that people have, um, I think a lot of the times the plants are just entertaining us. The visions that you're having is not quite as significant as the work that's going on under the hood with these plants. Some of the visions and the eye candy especially that you're experiencing, um, you know, people do experience beautiful music when they smoke 
Chang a bit. I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but the incredible um, uh, best pornography never made. <laughs> <laughs> incredible, uh, incredibly beautiful um, um, imagery that you can see. I think a lot of that can just be, um, again, a little bit like pleasure, the carrot on the stick, the impetus to do it again, because there's some processes going on in the organism whereby the neurotransmitters are enabling positive processes to occur. So I really do think that, yeah, even, even the geometry, geometry, the colours, those the colours you're seeing are pure colours. That the pure colour they're feeding your that's pure information. The geometry is the language of um, the universe. So I think um, it's um, it's beneficial it's to, to to see that. That's information in its purest form. And I think the intention of the plants is to help us. The plants actually uh, are benevolent. Uh, they, to me, they, they're obviously sentient. And they act as surgeons. They have a role to assist humanity to wake up and evolve. And on that note, uh, for me, it's always been very obvious. And I think in Australia, we have many different acacia plants that people use. Um, that that DMT is not DMT. You know, the scientific dogma will say DMT is DMT because it is DMT. So difference between synthetic DMT and absolutely pure 99.99% DMT from Lowe's Hostilis will be no difference because a molecule is a molecule is a molecule because we say that's what it is, that's what it is, and it ain't anything else apart from that, uh, which is dogma. And uh, my experience, the DMT is vastly different depending on the source of the DMT. In Australia, we have uh, some acacia sources which are absolutely pure DMT and... Um, uh, the, the, the imprints and the characteristics are vast. They're vast differences. And um, my, my theory is that DMT is not DMT. Uh, there are many different characteristics to the DMT. The, 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 the quality and nature of the DMT is dependent on the plant that it comes from because the plant that it comes from is the 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 artist is the uh, is the healer is the agent of the transformation occurring um i remember one time when i i i was testing out a batch of dmt and i experienced the uh, acacia spirit communicating with me the tree spirit and i was like and i kept smoking and i smoked it three times and i kept experiencing this i like is that all this batch is going to do? You know, I'm just communicating with the tree. Is that what everyone's going to experience? So I smoked it a fourth time and I experienced myself getting attacked by a, um, a quite a rabid tribe of cyber elves and kind of uh, had, had, a, had a good go at me. But in a sort of humorous way, it wasn't really malevolent. But after that, I was like, okay, well, this batch has more to offer than just the, the communication with the tree um, and of course you know I think despite there being differences with the batches of DMT you know DMT is a bit like a window and 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 there is there is a consistency to all batches of DMT that it is a window to um, um, a more expansive awareness, you know, a a a, 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 a deeper uh, a deeper reality, a, a more uh, transcendent and greater reality generally becomes apparent. There's there, there's a lot to experience there. So that's that's uh, that's all I have to say for now. But I'm gonna just, um, answer some questions. 
Hi, my name is Susie, and I have two questions for you, if it's okay. The first one being about the inhibitors, MAO inhibitors. And uh, my my issue with when smoking chanda is the, the fact that do these MOIs stay in your system and create an imbalance? Because I personally went through two weeks of after smoking chanda that was... I was in both worlds, and I couldn't eat meat, and I encountered other people that went through this, and actually one of them went to a doctor, and he was told that he had an MAO imbalance, and if he kept eating toxins like alcohol and meat, he would actually go blind. And uh, so that's my first question. It's about the MAO eyes, and if there's an imbalance afterward. The first question is about the beings that we encounter. Um, I sometimes feel that these beings are our own presentations of our microorganisms that live within us or the plants that we see as objects but have a soul and a spirit and we experience them so I am not sure if this could be a part of what we're experiencing and uh, I kind of woke up once as one of these beings so and I was I'm not happy that I was seeing myself in that way when I was there, so kind of, thank you. Related to MAO uh, balance, I don't know about that. Um, what I do know is that, say, when you smoke Chang'e uh, or you take ayahuasca, what happens is a lot of the times um, there is a greater resolution of what is not working for you. A lot is going to come up for you that is uh, will show you what is not working for you. I mean, people will drink ayahuasca and they think they're going to meet Jesus and aliens. It's all going to be wonderful. But a lot of people, they're going to experience what is not working for them in their life. They, it's going to be overwhelming. They're going to experience all this uh, bullshit, basically, and hopefully, you know, vomit it out and let go of it. Um, and that's because what I was saying before, there is um, somehow these plants are pushing a button and they're, they're actually um, aligning us in a, in a deeper way. So I don't know if there's an MAO imbalance Maybe there's a process of healing and balancing going on. I don't know. It doesn't sound right to me that, oh, we smoked Chang'e and then I was in balance and it put me out for a couple of weeks. I've been in processes that have lasted two weeks. Um, you know, I've, I've been in processes that have lasted months. It's possible for it to be two weeks afterwards, to stay. Yeah, I've experienced that. But that's, for me, that's positive because I can keep going. You know, that's, 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 that's brilliant. That means you've had a successful mission and the mission continues. For <laughs> and you can, I don't see that as an MAO imbalance. I see that as um, uh, perhaps, perhaps that's, that's what needed to happen for you at the time. Don't know. Um, I have heard the theory that people talk about these beings as being microorganisms or something. Um, it's fairly implausible as far as I'm concerned. That's just, that's, that's very fairly similar to the, it's all just hallucination. I'm just seeing what's going on in my gut rather than seeing what's going on in my head. Um, like I said, I think the most healthy way to see it is, I don't know, just I'm seeing what I'm seeing. I'm happy to see it. I'm experiencing it. It appears to be autonomous and appears to be communicating with me and, you can ask it, are you, are you, are you, are you like a microorganism in my gut? So maybe you should, next time you meet one, say, hey, buddy, you live in my liver, in my gut, in my intestines? What are, you, what, are you, what are you doing talking to me now? What have you got to say? So that's what I said. I have a question. Uh, I've got various questions, but starting with one um, about the dangers of combining uh, changa, especially the inhibitors that contain uh, contain changa, uh, the other way around. Uh, combining that with substances like MDMA, I bet that it's dangerous. Uh, but I've read conflicting stories about this. Um, whether wondering whether you have experience with this, uh, or at least an opinion about this. 
Yes. Um, I well, I got into trouble in the DMT nexus when I posted my article that uh, had some reference to MDMA in Chang'e without saying that this could cause a catastrophic case of serotonin syndrome. Right. Never heard of that happening. Uh, my experience with the MDMA in Chang'e is a brilliant combination. <laughs> and never heard of anyone having any problems with it. Uh, generally, you're working with natural plants. You're not working with pharmaceutical compounds that are fairly flexible in their action. Even SSRIs in Chang'e, ayahuasca in Chang'e, it still works. It's probably not a good idea. People aren't going to die. I guess you could die. Even MDMA and ayahuasca, even MDMA and SSRIs. <laughs> you know, really, um, you have to. You, I think you have to put in. You, you, you're either unlucky or you're that one in a million or one in a hundred who has some crazy reaction. What I hear is every now and then I hear about people have this crazy reaction um, or a reaction they can't explain that appears negative to them. And who knows what that is? You know, we just don't. I don't know. Um, but in terms of um, uh, drug combinations, um, yeah, you know, uh, I don't necessarily think that MDMA and Chagna is going to give you serotonin syndrome and kill you. I've never heard of that happening. I think that it's an overstated danger, but you might be the one in a hundred, which it does do that to. I don't know. It's, you've got to keep that in mind that there's there's strong, you know, there's strong possibility um, for for uh, potential trouble. Probably working with any psychedelic at any time, you know, or just just living your life and uh, riding your bike around Amsterdam. <laughs> and if it were if it were to form a risk, uh, would the order of taking it would that affect the risk? Like taking Changa after MDMA or the other way around, or there should be no difference? Because I don't know how long the MAO stays in your system as long as you should so stay so there much longer than the the experience lasts. I'd say right. Uh, Possibly, yeah, I mean, I think the MDMA appears to give you a relaxed state of mind whereby you can more confidently approach it. Um, you can have a more sort of confident, relaxed state of mind. So it may, that well may well be the reason why I found, um, other people I know found it more conducive, is that fear element is really but uh, I never noticed any hint that it was um, a, a negative combination. Okay. Um, can you tell us something about how you learned navigating in that world? I think um, I think that you learn navigating by actually doing it and then undergoing. The, the undergoing the innate lessons that you have related to the places that you go and experience. So what I say to people is like, you know, as you do it, you just go deeper and deeper and deeper. You go further and further and you go into new places and it doesn't necessarily become easier. It kind of becomes harder. And um, I think it's... It's the, the, the navigation is innate and um, you, you basically, if you're prepared to be receptive, um, there are many guides and teachers beside the plant spirits who can help you to, to take advantage of these of, of the states. So that's, that's what I would say to people, rather than having the idea, for example, in ayahuasca, community, I think some people have the idea that, that they're going to be taught by some Yoda-like um, shaman in the Amazon who's going to teach them how to do all this. Uh, most of the, the uh, esteemed curanderos, ayahuasqueros in the Amazon are self-taught, but they're not really self-taught. They just keep drinking and they keep learning by doing it. It's like anything, the more flight hours you have, the better you get at it. And you're going to crash your plane, you're going to go through all kinds of horrific incidences and things are going to happen to you, but it's all learning, you know. So um, 
Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's in the learning is inbuilt into the into the experience. Uh, um, I have two questions. Um, I was wondering when you navigate these realms, or like you know, everything out there, uh, I feel is a reflection of you, like this. Like, uh, uh, autonomous as well, um, and not everything is uh, uh, benevolent. So, do you feel that you can take any um, protective measures uh, to make sure you don't bring anything back that that's not yours, or you get into any weird contracts because you are, for example, I heard these things like some people have that encounter they they're all into this new age uh, aliens gonna save us thing, and they meet a, a, a Pleiadian being but it's actually a thing in disguise and they make a contract with yeah. it. So yeah. how, how can you feel that we can take any protective measure? I will save the second place. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good, that's a good, uh, it, it's generally less with China that you have issues with malevolence. It's generally, I, I almost feel like it's a bit more of a state of grace that you're in. And because you're a beginner, probably you're less of a threat to any sort of malevolence out there. Mm. Uh, and you, you, it only appears to me, for example, I was saying before, the people who do it a couple of years, things get a bit darker because mm -hmm. they're going a bit deeper and um, they're, they're actually becoming more of a threat perhaps to, um, uh, they're becoming uh, yeah, a threat to the malevolence because they're getting increased power. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I use a, a technique to protect myself. Um, I, I basically recommend sound, sound, any form of sound, chanting, you know, Icaros, you know, a form of sound. And I use a, um, a sound that I use to destroy any entities that are threatening me. And I use this in my daily life as well. I see entities in my daily life these days as well. Um, but these, this sound uh, kills them. Uh, and what you're saying um, about how do you know which are the good guys and which are the bad guys, because the bad guys are try they're generally disguising themselves to look like the good guys. Mm -hmm. My answer is you really got to fucking pay attention and like use your discernment and your judgment and um, it's not e always easy. Is there such a thing that you can say that they have to uh, show their true nature? I hear that sometimes, that there is like this universal law that, that if you ask a question that they have to show their, their true uh that sounds good. I, have, I haven't tried that, but that sounds good. Yeah, yeah. Just do that. Okay. Let me know if I'll yeah. magic password. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. But you generally, like, you go into discussion with them and you have enough reference points for the really good guys. The really good guys are doing really good stuff. You feel really good around them. Mm -hmm. And the, the ones who are a bit dodgy, who are, you know, wearing the, wearing the, wearing the costumes of the good guys, mm -hmm. you feel them out. You can feel that, wait on, someone's not right here. It's like you're, you're it's like being among other human beings. You know, like, yeah. oh, I don't want to buy that yeah. car from that used car salesman. Like, something's not right about that car. You know, I think he's lying to me, you know. It's just being, it's just using your, your, I felt a lot of intuitive sense mm -hmm. and um, yeah, no, it's, it's a little bit of an adventure. It's wow. a little bit of part of life and, you know, suddenly, you know, we, 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 all of us can, can get deceived and, you know, um, make connections with people who might actually really fuck us over. Mm -hmm. you know? And you just find that out five five years after marrying them or something. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> okay, I think it's. Um, um, but but yeah, this technique that I use um, is uh, I'm going to demonstrate it, and I call it talking, and um, it's a high pitched sound that pretty much I don't know anything. It just kills any everything. Mm. Probably that's not this, it can kill the good guys as well, but I never do it with them. Um, it, it's pretty pretty strong. So uh, yeah this, this is this is so just brace yourself a little bit.
but so that's the same thing as they do in the didgeridoo. I just oh, right, that okay. Right. <laughs> so that, that'll pretty much, you'll see them dissolve in front of you. But it's okay, because they're little microorganisms. Oh. <laughs> they're only little well, you guys, they're do, right? just part of me, so it's all me, it's all me, man. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, the, um, the second question. Uh, I only did, uh, smoked Janga once, and it was a day after I drank anawaska. Uh, so it, um, I did some fire breaths uh, to, 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 yeah, to really charge m myself with the oxygen, and I smoked it after. I think I hold my breath really long, but for me it was too intense. I was like catapulted to all these realms, and when I got back, I couldn't really make sense, except for that I saw. It felt like heaven on earth, but I, I never had this on psychedelics, but I felt like, oh my God, will this actually pass by because it's, 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 it's too much, even um, with the eyes open. <laughs> so, and then later I talked to, um, to a Wu um, and what he, what he likes to do um, is uh, smoke the changa when he is on uh, uh, Uwa because for, he says it's it slows time uh, down a little bit, so you can navigate through the zones. Have you ever heard about this, or is it sounds cool? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sounds right. Because for me, I couldn't make any sense of it, but I feel like cool to it. Look, maybe <laughs> another time. Yeah, I think I think you, you, it can be overwhelming and intense, and and um, you know that that can be the nature of it. And you don't have to smoke. I think th these days people are making these like 50% blends, like, you know, 72.5% DMT. It kind of defeats the purpose. You know? I think there's some benefit to just smoking a little yeah. and just going gen gently, gently, gently into that space. It doesn't yeah. have to be, you know, this, this, this Changa space is a more sub-breakthrough space where you're, experiencing a uh you know you're you're experiencing in your awareness these realities it can be overwhelming you mm -hmm. know so i think yeah this is my general advice to people is just take it easy just 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 start start off in the shallow end you don't need to to really push yourself uh, because it is overwhelming it is intense mm -hmm. and uh if you're a beginner you're just going to be scared off it sounds like that was, you know, that was like a strong, you know, really yeah, strong because the inhibitors from the, the other day, I don't know how long they're active. Maybe that was it. But it, for, for me, I couldn't make any sense of it. Not even, it's almost a year later now. I still. No, I mean, you know, um, Terence McKenna would, would talk about um, people who came to his talks who smoked DMT, uh, you know, a couple of decades ago and were still integrating it. We, I mean, uh, you know, just because, uh, uh, you know, Kanye is rapping about DMT doesn't mean that it's, that it's somehow like the popular culture, that it's somehow assimilatable. You know, it's often just vastly uh, unassimilatable and it just takes a lot of time. Demanding. So I think there can generally be something like a two year honeymoon that people have. With, with smoking techniques and then yeah like you know i'm more a proponent of non-traditional um taking dmt orally because that's a more that's a workspace that i find that that, that works best for me but you know saying that it's sort of um I don't necessarily judge people's, the you know, so-called recreational utilization of Changa. I don't think any psychedelics purely recreational. You know, again, it comes back to your mindset. Well, um, they, there's certain there's certain demanding elements within within psychedelics, and. Um, I think that um, it's necessary to, if you're really going to go somewhere with it, if you're really going to take it somewhere, then you've got to take it seriously. And I think it asks you to take it seriously, you know. Uh, I think that for a lot of people, it would kind of, it's got a sort of uh, inbuilt mechanism. For some people, it will just stop working, for example. 
stop working. And it would, or it would just say, stop doing this. You know, that happens quite commonly as well. So it has inbuilt mechanisms. I mean, it, I probably mean the plant, the plants, the particular plants from which the DMT comes, will communicate and say to people, or will stop giving people the experiences that they're looking for. You know? they've, they've sort of like, uh, got, they've got the message, you know, a little bit like, well, you got the message, hang up the phone. In terms of psychedelics, I mean, I think that um, because for me they're medicine, for me they're always beneficial. It's not like there's always a message there. For me it's a workspace. For me it's a, a space of being conscious and aware. It's not necessarily just receiving, you know, cosmic messages or having this illumination. That's a factor there too, you know, but I don't believe in just stopping them altogether and just, you know, continuing your yoga practice or whatever. Uh, I believe they're essential medicines and uh, necessary for our evolution at this point. So um, I think in the West we have this idea of hallucinations, of there being... Uh, a state in which you're, uh, it's almost like this narcissistic state, that what you're experiencing is just coming from your own brain. And this is evidently false. This is evidently bullshit that this is actually the case. It is very clearly that the, the experience that you're having are arising from an interrelationship of many different factors many of which are invisible and can't be seen, which would logically make sense considering we see ridiculously, uh, we have access to a very a small um, band of information that we can innately tune into. And I think when we smoke the tryptamines, we start to be able to like have a, an awareness that might have baseline awarenesses like that, suddenly we have this greater awareness and we can see so much more. We can have an awareness of many more things. And my, my understanding is that reality is vast and unlimited and unfathomable and hugely mysterious. And where does it end and where does it begin and how does it work? It's just impossible to understand. And for me, um, even, even with the vivid visions that I have and the incredible beings that I would meet and their communications, I think it does take a while for the quote-unquote rational mind to just give it up and just go, okay, well, that's what it is and that's what I'm experiencing now without necessarily having any recourse to any explanation but this is reality for me at this point, this is what I'm experiencing and it appears to be what it is appears to be, <laughs> not what my rational, quote unquote, rational mind says it is. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, well, the, the quote unquote rational mind, the unrational mind, I should say, it wants to maintain control. It often wants, doesn't want to like give up the idea that it doesn't understand reality because that's very threatening in survival terms. I call it the mammoth theory, the idea that if you if you, if you don't have a grip on the present circumstance, if you don't understand um, how things work, if you have to surrender control of your, uh, your, your awareness or your understanding, that, that, like, that hits us in the gut in survival sense and we think we're going to die. You know, there's something very fundamental in the human organism that wants to maintain um, the understanding that we have an awareness of how this works and how, how, how it functions. When we don't, we don't know what we don't know. There is so much we don't know. And I think the tryptamine show us that we don't know shit. And, you know, people who have extensive experience like Dennis McKenna, fully aware of that, fully aware. That is very, very good. If you don't get that, I don't know what to say to you. I recently uh, did an interview in Australia and I uh, filmed uh, 
interviewed 50 people. And one of the, the topics I wanted to talk about was uh, what were people's views or ideas of um, so-called supernatural phenomena or the beings that you can experience in the tryptomine space. And I was surprised. There was like a few people sitting on the fence. Uh, it was pretty much one guy who said that, that you know, he didn't, didn't believe in the beings. Everyone else is just like uh, come to terms with it. Um, so that's the sort of milieu we have in Australia. I was expecting at least, you know, I tried to find some people who, you know, would stand up and say, no, I don't believe in the beings. In, in the psychedelic world in general, um, um, it's just like Benny Shannon, there's James Kent, and um, there's a guy who lives in Rotterdam. His name, no, he lives in Den Haag. His name, Daniel Waterman, Daniel. also him. That's it, in there, people who write stuff and, and communicate in the psychedelic scene. They're the only people. Everyone else is just like either sitting on the fence or, you know, communicating some sort of compromised position but then having their own personal uh, position. Or I'd say in general, most people just come to terms with these realities but it's so evident. And I think you have to be a bit stupid not to get it. You'd have to, you'd, you really have to be someone who's just possessed by your own mind. Your mind parasites just take control. You know, you, you, you're so possessed by your mind parasite, you become stupid. This is, this is, this is perhaps the, the norm of the, skepti the skeptical mindset, something like that. I guess, I guess that kind of stupidity is fairly common in society. But, you know, go visit my friend, the old dog loving lumberjack. I mean, yeah, I suppose, yeah, come to me, you know, I'll change your mind. <laughs> it's not that hard. You just got to smoke it correctly. There really is um, a space of inquiry when we take psychedelics and that that's significant there is this awareness of the self and the relationships that we have there is a great awareness of the mind the emotion uh, all the complexity you can see it from many different perspectives and that workspace is valuable enough um, you don't need to have the experience of the, 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 the hyperdimensional consciousness. Some people will just not see visions. You know, some people will, will you know, no matter how much you give them, though they're fairly rare, but some people will not have visions. But that space, that self-awareness, that greater awareness you can have of yourself and this reality, that is significant. That is a space in which you can work on yourself. Where you can look at yourself and you can go under the hood and you can change. You can change some stuff. That's significant. That's the power of psychedelics. That's how we got a psychedelic renaissance because that kind of change, you don't, you don't get to talking for your therapist, you know, an hour a week, you know. It's that commonly said thing that, that psychedelics, 10 years of psychotherapy, in um, a few hours. Psychotherapists are said this to you, you drunk with them. It's, it's, it's that common thing because they can work when you can go, oh, all right, that's why I do that. Oh, I don't have to do that anymore, just let it go. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and there is that, that, that ability for, for the human being to really come into greater alignment with themselves. And there really is something in us that is aligned and tuned by these plants. And the mechanisms by which that happens, um, I think, are not well understood. We not really even understand what we are, you know. As far as I understand, uh, what we are is, is very mysterious. But I can say that... What, what a human being is, <clears throat> is brought back into balance and alignment. It's a little bit like uh, uh, 
being plugged back into the, the computer like you're some sort of sports car which is you know recalibrated back into factory settings. You know. And you know, plants like a boga will do that. They'll literally reset the brain. They will reset those settings. And the the aboga will will pretty much for most people, people will experience the aboga spirit communicating. <clears throat> you know, it has been something that many uh, neuroscientists have been trying to understand how a boga works. Um, my understanding of boga works because Dr. Aboga is communicating with the individual about their childhood and why they're so fucked up as an adult and how they can actually address that and fix that. Um, and that's just, that's just how it works. Um, it's, it's very simple, but I think that that you can say when you smoke Changi, you can really feel. It's almost within seconds you can feel this. You can feel this level of intensity whereby you you are brought back into a greater alignment with uh, yourself. You're brought into a more sincere contact with who you are and your reality. I think that is something that is, 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 is a strong part of it. And I think the reason why it feels good and is pleasurable and probably should feel good is your body is telling you, like, whatever you just did, do that shit again. <laughs> <laughs> that was really good. It did some good things. And that, that's, that's a, you know, as part of a Western society, which is opposed to intoxication or pleasure. And I think that, uh, well, I, I see pleasure as your body telling you, whatever you just did, <laughs> do that again. That, that really worked well for us, you know. And I think, you know, probably too much of a good thing is not a good idea. But basically, I think if you're able to listen to those mechanisms, you can... You can go beyond the pleasure and you can understand what is happening that is, is creating those good feelings, what is creating that, that, that really healthy, positive mindset because there's some internal adjustment going on. How will that is happening, the interrelationship of brain, the nervous system and um, the, the, the molecules and all that, it's, 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 still, it's still very unknown. We don't really know how it works. So related to the visions that people have, um, I think a lot of the times the plants are just entertaining us. The visions that you're having is not quite as significant as the work that's going on under the hood with these plants. Some of the visions and the eye candy especially that you're experiencing, um, you know, people do experience beautiful music when they smoke Changa, but I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but the incredible um, uh, best pornography never made. <laughs> incredible, uh, incredibly beautiful um, um, imagery that you can see. I think a lot of that can just be, um, again, a little bit like pleasure, the carrot on the stick, the impetus to do it again because there's some processes going on in the organism whereby the neurotransmitters are enabling positive processes to occur. So I really do think that, yeah, even, even the geometry, geometry, the colors, those, the colors you're seeing are pure colors. That, the pure color, they're feeding your, that's pure information. The geometry is the language of um, the universe. So I think, um, it's um, 
it's beneficial it's to, to, to see that. That's information in its purest form. And I think the intention of the plants is to help us. The plants actually uh, are benevolent. Uh, they, to me, they, they're obviously sentient. And they act as surgeons. They have a role to assist humanity to wake up and evolve. And on that note, uh, for me, it's always been very obvious. And I think in Australia, we have many different acacia plants that people use. Um, that, that DMT is not DMT, you know. The scientific goldman will say DMT is DMT because it is DMT. So difference between synthetic DMT and absolutely pure 99.9% DMT from Mohs Hostilis will be no difference because a molecule is a molecule is a molecule because we say that's what it is, that's what it is. And it ain't anything else apart from that, uh, which is dogma. And uh, my experience, the DMT is vastly different depending on the source of the DMT. In Australia, we have uh, some acacia sources which are absolutely pure DMT. And um, uh, the, the, the imprints and the characteristics are vast. They're vast differences. And um, my, my theory is that DMT is not DMT. Uh, there are many different characteristics to the DMT. The, 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 the quality and nature of the DMT is dependent on the plant that it comes from because the plant that it comes from is the, the, the artist, is the, uh, is the healer, is the agent of the transformation occurring. Um, I remember one time when I... I, I was testing out a batch of DMT and I experienced the uh, acacia spirit communicating with me, the tree spirit. And I was like, and I kept smoking and I smoked it three times and I kept experiencing this. I'm like, is that all this batch is going to do? You know, I'm just communicating with the tree. Is that what everyone's going to experience? So I smoked it a fourth time and I experienced myself getting attacked by a, um, quite a rabid tribe of cyber elves and kind of uh, had, had, a, had a good go at me, but in a sort of humorous way. It wasn't really malevolent. But after that, I was like, okay, well, this batch has more to offer than just the, the communication with the, with the tree. Um, and, of course, you know, I think despite there being differences with the batches of DMT, you know, DMT is a bit like a window. And 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 there is there is a consistency to all batches of DMT that it is a window to um, um, a more expansive awareness, you know, a a a, 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 a deeper uh, a deeper reality, a, a more uh, transcendent and greater reality generally becomes apparent. There's, there, there's a lot to experience there. So that's that's uh, that's all I have to say for now. But I'm gonna just, um, answer some questions. Hi, my name is Susie, and I have two questions for you, if it's okay. The first one being about the inhibitors, MAO inhibitors. And uh, my my issue with when smoking changa is the the fact that do these MOIs stay in your system and create an imbalance? Because I personally went through two weeks of after smoking changa that was I, I was in both worlds and I couldn't eat meat and I encountered other people that went through this and actually one of them went to a doctor and he was told that he had an MAO imbalance and if he kept eating toxins like alcohol and meat, he would actually go blind. And uh, so that's my first question. It's about the MAO eyes and if there's an imbalance afterward. The first question is about the beings that we encounter. Um, I sometimes feel that these beings are our own presentations of 
our microorganisms that live within us or the plants that we see as objects but have a soul and a spirit and we experience them so I am not sure if this could be a part of what we're experiencing and uh, I kind of woke up once as one of these beings so and I was I'm not happy that I was seeing myself in that way when I was there so kind of thank you Related to MAO uh, balance, I don't know about that. Um, what I do know is that, say, when you smoke Chang'e uh, or you take ayahuasca, what happens is a lot of the times um, there is a greater resolution of what is not working for you a lot is going to come up for you that is uh, will show you what is not working for you. I mean, people will drink ayahuasca and they think they're going to meet Jesus and aliens. It's all going to be wonderful. But a lot of people, they're going to experience what is not working for them in their life. They, it's going to be overwhelming. They're going to experience all this uh, bullshit, basically, and hopefully, you know, vomit it out and let go of it. Um, and that's because what I was saying before, there is um, somehow these plants are pushing a button and they're, they're actually um, aligning us in a, in a deeper way. So I don't know if there's an MAO imbalance. Maybe there's a process of healing and balancing going on. I don't know. It doesn't sound right to me that, oh, we smoked Changa and then I was in balance and put me out for a couple of weeks. I've been in processes that have lasted two weeks. Um, you know, I've, I've been in processes that have lasted months. It's possible for it to be two weeks afterwards, to stay. Yeah, I've experienced that, but that's, for me, that's positive because I can keep going. You know, that's, 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 that's brilliant. That means you've had a successful mission and the mission continues for, <laughs> and you can, I don't see that as an MAO imbalance. I see that as um, uh, perhaps, perhaps that's, that's what needed to happen for you at the time. I don't know. Um, I have heard the theory that people talk about these beings as being microorganisms or something. Um, it's fairly implausible as far as I'm concerned. That's just, that's, that's very fairly similar to the, it's all just hallucination. I'm just seeing what's going on in my gut rather than seeing what's going on in my head. Um, like I said, I think the most healthy way to see it is, I don't know, just I'm seeing what I'm seeing. I'm happy to see it. I'm experiencing it. It appears to be autonomous and appears to be communicating with me and you can ask it, are you, are you, are you, are you like a microorganism in my gut? So maybe you should, next time you meet one, say, hey, buddy, you live in my liver, in my gut, in my intestines. What are, you, what, are you, what are you doing talking to me now? What have you got to say? So that's what I said. That. I have a question, uh, I've got various questions, but starting with one, um, about the dangers of combining uh, Changa, especially the inhibitors that can change, uh, can change Changa, uh, the other way around. Uh, combining that with substances like MDMA, I've read that it's dangerous, uh, but I've read conflicting stories about this. Um, whether wondering whether you have experience with this, uh, or at least an opinion about this. Yes. Um... I, well, I got into trouble in the DMT Nexus when I posted my article and uh, had some reference to MDMA in Changa without saying that this could cause a catastrophic case of serotonin syndrome. Right. Never heard of that happening. Uh, my experience with MDMA in Changa is a brilliant combination. <laughs> and never heard of anyone having any problems with it. Uh, generally, you're working with natural plants, you're not working with pharmaceutical compounds that are fairly flexible in their action. Even SSRIs in Changa, ayahuasca in Changa, it still works. It's probably not a good idea. People aren't going to die. I guess you could die. Even MDMA and ayahuasca, even MDMA and SSRIs, <laughs> you know, really, um, you have to, you, I think you have to put in 
you, you, you're either unlucky or you're that one in a million or one in a hundred who has some crazy reaction. What I hear is every now and then I hear about people have this crazy reaction um, or a reaction they can't explain that appears negative to them. And who knows what that is? We just don't. I don't know. Um, but in terms of um, uh, drug combinations, um, yeah, you know, uh, I don't necessarily think that MDMA and Chagnet is going to give you serotonin syndrome and kill you. I never heard of that happening. I think that it's an overstated danger, but you might be the one in a hundred, which it does do that to. I don't know. It's, you've got to keep that in mind that there's there's a strong you know a strong possibility um, for for uh, potential trouble, probably working with any psychedelic at any time you know or just just living your life and uh, riding your bike around Amsterdam. <laughs> um, if it were if it were to form a risk, uh, would the order of taking it would that affect the risk? like taking Changa after MDMA or the other way, other way around, or there should be no difference? Because I don't know how long the MAO stays in your system as long as you should. should stay there system. much longer than the the experience lasts, I'd say. Right. Uh, possibly, yeah, I mean, I think the MDMA appears to give you a relaxed state of mind whereby you can more confidently approach it, um, you can have a more sort of confident, relaxed state of mind. So it may, that well may well be the reason why I found um, other people I know found it more conducive is that fear element is really out of the way. Um, so I never noticed any hint that it was um, a, a negative combination. Um. Can you tell us something about how you learned navigating in that world? I think um, I think that you learn navigating by actually doing it and then undergoing the the undergoing the innate lessons that you have related to the places that you go. So what I say to people is like, you know, as you do it, you just go deeper and deeper and deeper. You go further and further and you go into new places and it doesn't necessarily become easier. It kind of becomes harder. And um, I think it's, it's the, the, the navigation is innate and um, you, you basically... If you're prepared to be receptive, uh, there are many guides and teachers beside the plant spirits who can help you to, to take advantage of this of, of the states. So that's that's what I just say to people. Rather than having the idea, for example, in the ayahuasca community, I think some people have the idea that, that they're going to be taught by some Yoda like. Um, shaman in the Amazon who's going to teach them how to do all this. Uh, most of the, the uh, esteemed curanderos, ayahuasqueros in the Amazon are self-taught, but they're not really self-taught. They just keep drinking and they keep learning by doing it. It's like anything, the more flight hours you have, the better you get at it. And you're going to crash your plane, you're going to go through all kinds of horrific incidences and things are going to happen to you, but it's all learning. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's in the learning is inbuilt into the into the experience. Basically. So, um, I have two questions. Um, I was wondering when you navigate these realms, uh, like not everything out there, uh, I feel is a reflection of you, like this. Like, uh, uh, autonomous as well, um, and not everything is um, uh, benevolent. So do you feel that you can take any um, protective measures uh, to make sure you don't bring anything back that, that's not yours or you get into any weird contracts because you are, for example, I've heard these things like some people have that encounter, they, they're all into this new age, uh, aliens gonna save us thing and they meet a, a, a Pleiadian being 
but it's actually a thing in disguise and they make a contract with yeah. it. So yeah. how, how can you feel that we can take any protective measure? I will save the second question. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good, that's a good, uh, it's, it's generally less with China that you have issues with malevolence. It's generally, I, I almost feel like it's a bit more of a state of grace that you're in. And because you're a beginner, probably you're less of a threat to any sort of malevolence out there. Mm. Uh, and you, you, it only appears to me, for example, I was saying before, the people who do it a couple of years, things get a bit darker because mm -hmm. they're going a bit deeper and um, they're, they're actually becoming more of a threat perhaps to, um, uh, they're becoming, uh, yeah, a threat to the malevolence because they're getting increased power. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I, I use a, a technique to protect myself. Um, I, I basically recommend sound, sound, any form of sound, chanting, you know, Icaros, you know, any form of sound. And I use a, um, a sound that I use to destroy any entities that are threatening me. And I use this in my daily life as well. I see entities in my daily life these days as well. Uh, but these, this sound uh, kills them. Uh, and what you're saying um, about how do you know which are the good guys and which are the bad guys, because the bad guys are try they're generally disguising themselves to look like the good guys. Mm -hmm. My answer is you really got to fucking pay attention and like use your discernment and your judgment and um, it's not e always easy. Is there such a thing that you can say that they have to uh, show their true nature? I hear that sometimes, that there is like this universal law that, that if you ask a question that they have to show their, their true uh Identity. That sounds good. I, have, I haven't tried that. But that sounds good. Yeah. If you do that, okay. then let me know. If yeah. Magic password. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. But you generally, like, you go into discussion with them and you have enough reference points for the really good guys. Well, the really good guys are doing really good stuff. You feel really good around them. Mm -hmm. And the, the ones who are a bit dodgy, who are, you know, wearing the, wearing the, wearing the costumes of the good guys, mm -hmm. you can feel them out. You can feel that, wait on, something's not right here. It's like you're, you're it's like being among other human beings. You know, like, yeah. oh, I don't want to buy that yeah. car from that used car salesman. Like, something's not right about that car. You know, I think he's lying to me, you know. It's just being, it's just using your, your, a felt a lot of intuitive sense mm -hmm. and um yeah no it's it's a little bit of an adventure it's wow. a little bit of part of life and you know some, suddenly you know we, we we all of us can can get deceived and you know um make connections with people who might actually really fuck us over mm -hmm. you know? And you just find that out five five years after marrying them or something. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> um, but, but yeah, this technique that I use um, is uh, I'm going to demonstrate it, and I call it talking, and um, it's a high pitched sound that pretty much I don't know anything. It just kills any everything. Mm. Probably that's not this. It can kill the good guys as well, but I never do it with them. Um, it, it's pretty pretty strong. So uh, yeah this, this is this is so just brace yourself a little bit. That's so that was the same as they do in the didgeridoo. I just oh, right. that up, right? <laughs> so that that'll pretty much you'll see them dissolve in front of you. But it's okay because they're little microorganisms in like this test. Well you might shit it out guys, they're right? just part of me, so it's all me, it's all me, man. Okay. So. Okay, um, so, um, the second question, uh, I only did, uh, smoked Janga once and it was the day after I drank Anahuasca. Uh, so it, um, I did some fire breaths uh, to, 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 yeah, to really charge myself with the oxygen and I smoked it after. I think I hold my breath really long, but for me it was too intense. I was like catapulted to all these realms and when I got back I couldn't really make sense. 
except for that I saw it felt like heaven on earth, but I, I never had this on psychedelics, but I felt like, oh my God, will this actually pass by because it's, 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 it's too much, even um, with the eyes open. <laughs> so, and then later I talked to, um, to a Wu um, and what he, what he likes to do um, is uh, smoke the changa when he's on uh, uh, Uwa because for, he says it's, it slows time uh, down a little bit, so you can navigate through the zones. Have you ever heard about this or is it? Sounds cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sounds right. Because for me, I couldn't make any sense of it, but I feel like cool to it. Look, maybe <laughs> another time. Yeah, I think, I think you, you, it can be overwhelming and intense and, and um, you know, that, that can be the nature of it. And you don't have to smoke. I think th these days people making these like 50% blends, like, you know, 72.5% DMT, it kind of defeats the purpose. You know? I think there's some benefit to just smoking a little bit yeah. and just going gen gently, gently, gently into that space. It doesn't yeah. have to be, you know, this, this, this Changa space is a more sub breakthrough space where you're, experiencing a uh you know you're you're experiencing in your awareness these realities it can be overwhelming you mm -hmm. know so i think yeah this is my general advice to people is just take it easy just 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 start start off in the shallow end you don't need to to really push yourself uh, because it is overwhelming it is intense mm -hmm. and uh if you're a beginner you're just going to be scared off it sounds like that was, you know, that was like a strong, you know, really Yeah, maybe because the inhibitors from the, the other day, I don't know how long they're active, maybe that was it. But it, for, for me, I couldn't make any sense of it. Not even, it's almost a year later now, I still... No, I mean, you know, um, Terence McKenna would, would talk about um, people who came to his talks who smoked DMT, uh, you know, a couple of decades ago and were still integrating it. We, I mean, uh, you know, just because, uh, uh, you know, Kanye is rapping about DMT doesn't mean that it's, that it's somehow, like, that it's popular culture, that it's somehow assimilatable. You know, it's often just vastly uh, unassimilatable and it just takes a lot of terror of it lies. And not just like, you know, these ayahuasca churches where everyone's, you know, doing all the stuff that religion always does, singing the same songs, dancing the same dance, but actually going in there together and working together and, you know, um, actually having these meaningful experiences. So, yeah, I'd say that that be a real evolution of the workspace. But I, I have heard of groups doing that and working in the room and talk to some people, but it's not not that common. I, I know I have some experience with ayahuasca, but you have also experience with using changa. Uh, with, uh, Again, it's not uh, enough time. You know, I think you sure an hour, hour or two, three, you know. You really, yeah. Uh, I think that, that uh, that's why the ayahuasca is, is beneficial in that way. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yep. Um, I just have a, a question that I'm just curious. Do you think psychedelic substances are um, for everyone? Like, what's your personal opinion? Um, you know, I just think. Like, I'm really sorry. Like, um, obviously, notion in the 60s, like, everybody takes this medicine, but it's going to be. I think it's a little bit outdated in the sense of, like what you were saying, so uh, you know, for example, people that have some sort of uh, mental illness, for example, it's not recommended for them to actually take psychedelics because it could trigger, could be a trigger for very many experiences. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious what's your opinion on whether psychiatric substances are working on. I think um, that it really depends on the substance and the dose. I think that probably the uh, the cactus is very underutilized, and you know you could really give a dose of cactus to everyone, and then they're not going to be like overwhelmed by it. It's going to be beautiful, and they're going to be, you know, it's like MDMA. You give MDMA to most people, they're like, this is great. You know, same with cactus. It's not as not really overwhelming. You don't have to give people a big dose. 
and they can just they can just have a, a, a beautiful experience. So, you know, I don't think there's any. I'd say po- probably, you know, Chang is not very well. But in terms of um, psychedelics, I'd say, well, probably everyone could, could, could get something out of microdosing mushrooms or taking like a half a gram or a gram of dried mushroom every month. Um, that's not going to be overwhelming. Most people, it's going to be um, beneficial for, for most people. So yeah, I'd say I'd say yeah, pretty much everyone can get can find something that they like that they can work with and that's not that's just going to help them. Uh, I have a question about the, the notion of a breakthrough. So typically, um, a breakthrough is described as this magical tipping point, um, at which point you go from sub breakthrough space to post breakthrough space. Um, I, I have experience with both DMT and Changa, and numer- numerous occasions I've been blown in the mind, uh, but I'm still not sure whether I've experienced a, a breakthrough. So I'm wondering, um, do you think a breakthrough is almost a quantifiable event that is very st- distinct, or is it more like a running gag, kind of defined by your personal limits, um, Yeah, whether you cross your own personal limits set by your prior experience with psychedelics? Um, yeah, I mean, back in the early days, I met people who were talking about the various like aspects of the breakthrough, like the dome and this, that, and the other thing. And um, I think that yeah, there seems to be some sort of place in which you emerge beyond this membrane and you go into this indescribable dimension that's just like not the third dimension at all. And you're just not able to bring much back from that because how can you bring back this dimensional information back into the third dimension? You can't. So I'd probably say, yeah, the breakthrough is into that realm beyond the third dimension. Um, and this generally chain is some breakthrough in that you're experiencing what you're looking at and experiencing is kind of third dimensional ish. It's sort of it, it's, you can assimilate it in third dimensional terms. But the breakthrough appears to be like other dimensional stuff that you just you're there and you're just like, well, this is incredible, but you just don't remember it until you go back and then you remember it. You remember all your experiences when you go back there. You know, mm-hmm. it's wild. So um, it's one of those things that yeah, I think possibly. That, that breakthrough is valuable experience to have, but who knows why? I think it probably gives you some sort of reference point for the human experience. It gives you some understanding of, uh, it gives you some ineffable reference point for what reality is. And you get communicated about what reality is. And what I've noticed is that You know, some people say when people keep trying to have a breakthrough experience or keep trying to smoke DMT, the beings say, what are you coming back here for? Like, we told you everything already. What what more do you need to know? Go back and be a human being, you know. So you were talking about this um, this mindset that you need to acquire in order to work with it. Um, Kind of related to the previous question, what are the the characteristics of this mindset and how how would you... how would you say to facilitate it? I think that the individual has to develop their own mindset and tweak their own mindset and come to a mindset that works for them, that they find beneficial, that they find some results and they gain some benefits and then they they can go, okay, well, my intention this time, and they experience something more and they, like I said, you've got to have an understanding of what's in it for you and what you can get out of it. And then you can refine your mindset and, and, and I guess that's part of the navigation is calibrating your coordination with what you're really doing when you're, when you're having these experiences. Right. One more question. Um, I often have problems having a very strong body load as I, as I take DMT or Changa. Um, do you have any advice regarding this? 
uh, I loaded in the sense of it's blocking me from really go, wanting to go take more and go further and deeper into the experience. What's blocking you? A, bo- a body load. Is that? Oh, right. Like okay. the very, very, very heavy feeling in the body. Almost, almost making me sick, so to say. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's like, I probably wouldn't know what to say if you ask me, what do I do about the nausea when I'm drinking ayahuasca? I'd say, well, it's part of the experience and you just got to go with it. I don't get nausea so much drinking ayahuasca because I feel like that nausea is when you don't have your sea legs yet, you know, and you, you, you're kind of still coordinating yourself as you, you, your, your reference systems haven't, don't understand where you are. So I think that nausea, for me, that nausea is... Um, uh, just, just, just part of it. So I'd say, yeah, the heaviness and the feeling. I don't know. I mean, you probably just got to keep. I don't know. Maybe don't take as much. I'm sure there's some tweakings to be done there if that that's getting in, getting in the way for you. But I, I, I don't know. That's all. Cool. Thank you. Um, a common thing that I experience is kind of like an alien written language. Well, this is the interesting thing. Like, you see these banners with this alien language all the time, you know? It's like, where the hell does that come from? Oh, my little fucking microorganisms, my God. They're doing some crazy calligraphy in there. Oh, my God, they've got a whole language. It looks like completely alien. So it's like, yeah, um, basically, uh, yeah, that's really common. Yeah, yeah, as part of my job is to say, you, that's normal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm curious what your thoughts are on them, though. I don't know what to make. I can't read it. I can't read it. I think part of me knows what did they say. What the, what, a lot of those languages look fairly similar, but it doesn't seem to be a universal language. And um, a lot of people report this. I think it's, it's like pretty fascinating and you know, just just based upon that, you know, like, oh, so why would the brain hallucinate alien languages on these banners? <laughs> <laughs> why would the brain do that to itself? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I don't understand that. Do you? Do you see any value or danger in um, uh, adding, like, okay, <laughs> I, will, I will ask you. Uh, in, in, uh, adding, uh, uh, instead of uh, DMT using rufotamine, or like rufo, uh, rufo alpharius. I'm not a big fan of the rufo alpharius. <laughs> Uh, when I have done it, it felt like I'm being poisoned by COVID. <laughs> it felt like oh, I'm being overcome by a toad and I'm dying. And it's like, not ego death, but oh, I'm being killed by this venom. Um, so I'm not a big toad fan. I've been invited to the World Bufo Averius Congress in Mexico this year uh, to talk about plant sources and fire and you know, tick. So that's what I'm researching and is what I believe in is more viable. I think just like I made a Twitter update today, leave the toads alone. <laughs> uh, that's like my, that's my answer. It's beneficial. Again, um, I'm more into low dose 5 neo um, something of the order of five milligram. 5 neo is incredibly therapeutic. It's like people keep reaching for these deep mystical states all the time. You know, it's like they're addicted to this superpowered mystical experiences. But it's like once you've experienced that a few times, you kind of get the message that um, I don't know if you want to keep going back there. To be honest, it's not that not that many people do, but many people do think that um, the five, the lower dose, the equivalent of Chang'e for five meo, for me that. That, at the moment, that's the holy grail. The five million grams, fusing herbs, natural practice. That's what I'm working on. Infused with the same recipe you like to share just now. That's that, no, probably no MO, definitely no MO inhibitors at all. Just probably marlene, 
low tests. Uh, I made, uh, you know, I got, I got a shit ton of synthetic flag neo at the Boom Festival. It was like 2008. Someone was just getting rid of it for ten dollars a gram, and this ridiculous amount of it. And I just made this stuff called Cracker, and it was like five percent flag neo in Moline and uh, Blue Lotus and. Um, that, I think that was good. And that that's powerful. That's really good. Cool. And you just smoke that in a joint and take a puff or two. It's fantastic. That is some really feel good medicine. I think. Yeah, for me the, the synthetic I stopped doing it because I just felt um, a bit I felt a bit that the synthetic was um, a bit fake. I felt it a bit forced. And I felt it was a bit harsh, so that's why I'm for the natural source of you know. But then again, you know, you take a high dose of the bufo, um, you take a high dose of the synthetic, you go to the same place, you won't be you won't be in any headspace to be able to think, hmm, how was the synthetic and the and the bufo various? What are the differences between the molecules here? So you're gone. So I take you to the same place. And a natural source of vitamin D. Um, if you want to understand, look look into the research, I have a YouTube um, channel. I have a clip called uh, Ethnographical Exploration about all my research in natural vitamin D. Um, you just follow me. Um, on, on um, social media, wherever I'm going to do more research this year. And... I was curious about the V charge period with uh, EMT. So, for example, with uh, LSD, you uh, typically you'll want to wait several days between trips because it wants to be as impactful to try to trip again on a subsequent day. And it seemed Maybe I got the wrong idea that this is a list of DMT was gonna wait gonna wait until the next next day to do it again. And is there any advice you can recommend on the minimum period or any beverage or way to recharge yourself or if that works? Yeah, that I I I used to think that too, because I was reading that in the Indian review or something in the late nineties or something, or was on Arrow. But I never found it to be true at all. It was like, no, you just actually, um, yeah, reload your pipe and go straight back in there. And if you, especially if you're working with China, because you're increasing the amount of MAO inhibitors um, in your brain, um, basically it's, it's, it's going to last longer. So you'll get longer duration on the third smoke. But the inhibiting factor is actually what what the actual uh what actually wants you uh how can i say this uh what it wants you to experience there's a point at which you've kind of like um used used up your credit you know you've actually like um you you had enough now you, you you've done your dash and you can't you can't push for more and that might be after one experience or it might I have heard of some people or know some people who smoke DMT all night. I can't do that. After about the third or fourth time, it's like it's it just not, nothing worthwhile happens. It's just making fun of me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's like a man of, you know, not from DMT, it's like a manufactured experience at the time. So, and if the, the experience that is getting manufactured is just like obviously telling you, stop doing this, you, you're not going to keep doing it. So yeah, the, the reload thing, I think that's some sort of urban myth that got, got, got promulgated out there. Um, that's funny. I, I mean, I personally have experienced that. And, oh, uh, yes. and, and in fact, also, uh, as a good example, mm -hmm. if you don't smoke it quick enough, like if you're smoking it and you take your time too much, you sort of miss the, the launch kind of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I think I'm of the one toke. Um, um, the one toke school, just one, just do one, one long toke, and and um, it can just be over 30, 40 seconds. That's perfect. 
that's perfect. I don't believe in doing two or three. If you get all in one, that's when you can hit the nail on the head for sure. But what you were saying before, how you experienced the the, uh, the, the, the reload factor, that reload factor may in fact be just the DMT saying, all right, buddy, you, you've, had your, you've had your DMT experience. We don't want to play with you now. And it might just not work. And oftentimes, you know, it might not just work at all. And then you don't know why it doesn't work. It's just, all right, we don't want to play today. There's nothing to say today. You know, the stars are unaligned. We're on holiday. Back to Monday. That's how it works. All right, so I think uh, maybe one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think of correlation with LSD? You know what? I have to admit, I haven't really explored that combination. And I should have done that like way back when, and I haven't really done it. Uh, people have done it tell me it's fucking epic. <laughs> um, that, you know, 400 mics and smoking DMT, like, deep as you can go. Um, and they've, they've had really, and, and because you, you take four or 500 mics, you're just totally there anyway, almost. <laughs> and you smoke the DMT, it's just like, oh, just push it a bit further. Yes, you know. Uh, maybe I'll get there one day, but honestly, I'm not massively inspired and more, <laughs> and more into taking long baths and saunas and like, you know, lying on the beach these days. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to Julian Palmer for sharing your story and your knowledge and your insights. Uh, I feel that really resonated with a lot of people here. Um, so Julian is going to do a book signing later, so you can buy a book, have a book signed, so uh, just say hello. And um, just a couple of uh, announcements. There's a, there's a shoot, there's a few of these around of uh, psychedelic events around the community. Um, one of the main ones is <coughs> introducing.nl the big seminar next Sunday. Um, the last one was really amazing. It was really beautiful, very knowledgeable. Um, so I do recommend that. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on. You can check it out. I won't keep you it any longer. And you can stay and have a drink and some food. And uh, thank you again for coming. Yeah. <laughs>